Si me están haciendo yo digo se escucha esto no inglés Well, good morning everyone. My name is Gaston and today I have the pleasure to introduce Gerardo Rubino. He is a senior researcher at INRIA, the French National Institute for Research in Computer Science and Control. He created and managed two research teams at INRIA over covering a period of 30 years, Armon and Dionysos, working on the analysis and design of complex systems, usually in telecommunications. He has been board member of the media and networks clusters, Britain and France, for about 15 years. And among past responsibilities, he has been scientific, scientific delegate for RENS unit of INRIA for five years, responsible of research in networking at the Telecom British Engineer School for five years, associate editor of the Operations Research International Journal Naval Research Logistics for nine years, former member of the steering board of the European Network of Excellence and responsible of the relationships between the network and European industry. In Rias representative at the CISCOM Brittany Research Cluster. He has also been the head of the International Partnership Office at INRIA RENS for five years. He's interested in the quantitative analysis of complex systems using probabilistic models. He presently works on performance and dependability analysis, perceptual quality assessment of audio and video applications and services and on machine learning tools with applications mainly in networking. In particular, he is the author of the Pseudo Subjective Quality Assessment Technology for Automatic Perceptual Quality Real Time Evaluation. And he also works on the develop development of methodologies for the analysis of rare events, for instance, the evaluation of risk. Gerardo, I don't know, I don't know if I miss anything. In that case, please clear it up. So then I give you leave you with the presentation called Using Machine Learning in Communication Network Research. Thank you very much. And thank you, the organizers, for the invitation. Um, I will describe a few um, areas where our team uh, works and I'm involved with and uh and we use machine learning techniques this no okay there are some keywords um characterizing what the team the whole team does and um from the machine learning point of view we use uh, techniques coming from the main families of methods, uh, in super supervised and unsupervised and reinforcement learning. Um, I divided, uh, when I proposed the abstract, the talk in four topics, but when I prepared the slides, it was too much, so I removed the last one. So the last one here, and I will try to say something at least on these three topics. So let's go to the first one, which is the evaluation of the quality of experience, more precisely the perceptual quality, a subjective concept when uh, we look mainly at the applications or services built around the transmission of video or sound or voice content. And there are three points, basically two points. Our tool 
our learning tool, which is called Random Neural Networks, which is an exotic family of techniques, not very known in the machine learning area. And I will say a few words why we use that. Part, in part is from the, our mathematical presentation in our teams, but there are technical reasons for which we chose these, these specific tools. And I will say something about the, our main applications. And a very, I, I will just mention a few elements of the, the origin of the model, which is a probabilistic origin. So let's go. Um, when I describe this, these days I use this kind of approach. Uh, let us identify um, an artificial neuron with the activation function of the neuron. So we have a, a real function of a real variable here, u. Uh, for instance, taking this shape, this form here, or any of the sigmoid logistics, rectify linear units, etc. Function, you have always a parameter of the function, the bias B here, and you all know we interconnect these things to make a network with which we, for instance, learn something. The random neural network is a function of two variables. Uh, let me go back. When you connect neural classical, classic neural networks, uh, connecting the output of one neuron to the input port of several uh, other neurons, you know that you use weight to, uh, as a multi, as a factor of the signals of the value of the output. And the weights are positive or negative, trying to mimic the behavior of uh, human neurons. In the, in the random neural case, the signals, all the signals are positive numbers. The output is a positive number, taking this form, basically. Actually, the, the, the main one you use in the software where people implemented this is the, the other function here, where you bound, you take the mean between that fraction, that ratio, and one. In that way, the output here is always less than or equal to one. Um, so here, the main difference with the classic model is that you have two inputs. We say that the, the U signal attacks the positive port of the neuron and the V1, the negative port. The output is a single one, a scalar, which is a positive number. And the weight, as shown, I will skip this, because the analysis of the function when you take the mean is uh, something trivial. When you connect neurons to make a network, you take the signal coming out of neuron one and you attack the input port of the other neurons in the model. And you weight the signals using only positive weights and you indicate the case, uh, the, the fact that the signal uh, U2, that is the signal arriving at this port, is the signal coming out of neuron one weighted by W plus, indicating that you're attacking the positive port of neuron two coming from one. And uh, similarly, when you make a join, the arrival signal here, for instance, let, let's take the negative one, comes from different sources, and the combination is, of course, an additive function. So this is the way you build networks. The main difference to remember is that uh, the weights here are all positive. Um, this slide shows that in some cases, this comes from the origin of the model. You will add this constraint. The sum of all the weights coming out of neuron i is equal to the rate. But you can ignore this 
And sometimes we are building a software now to, to, to add some possibilities to this model. And this is now an option of the, of the library. Uh, consider, for instance, this three layer, the class cat feed forward architecture, where the input neurons are those, plus the fact, uh, which is usual in, when you use these tools, the input neurons here, random neurons, will have always a zero attacking the negative port. So the input of the network are the numbers arriving, the signals arriving at the positive ports of all the units here. It's just, uh, it doesn't change anything. On the power, you can study that and it has been done. Uh, it simplifies the, the manipulation of this thing. If you do that, uh, the output, uh, the output um, of the network from neuron O, you can have many neurons in the output layer, is a rational function of the input here. Then the inputs are x1, x2 for all the equal neurons. So the, as you see here, if you simplify this horrible fraction, you will get a polynomial divided by a polynomial in the x variables. Of course, the degree will be perhaps high, depends on the number of neurons in the hidden layer, but you have a polynomial divided by a polynomial. And uh, if you look at that as a function of the weight for learning, for instance, you have polynomials upstairs and downstairs, so you can do easily whatever you want uh, with this kind of function. And this is what we do when you use this kind, this kind of model. About the origin of the model, very quickly, for those familiar with these kind of things, this is a, an MM1Q. Lambda is typical notation for the arrival rate, the speed at which the people arrive at the queue. Mu is the rate of the server. It's the departure rate when there is somebody taking service here. And you know, remember, or believe me, the, so this is a stochastic object. If lambda is strictly less than mu, the thing is stable. Everything happens as you nicely, let's say. At infinity, the number of, the distribution of the number of people in the queue is a stationary thing. Um, doesn't depend on time. The distribution, the dynamic is always the same, of course. The same thing is ergodic, etc. Um, you know, we know the distribution, the steady state, the equilibrium distribution of the number of people in the queue, which is a geometric distribution. And the row here is the ratio between uh, arrival and departure and, de and departure rate, lambda mu, and which is less than one in the stable case, strictly. And it's also equal to the probability that the system is busy at infinity, when time goes to infinity. And you can prove also that when lambda is more, is larger than or equal to mu, then there is this some point, some finite point in time, after which the system is always busy un until the end of the universe, probability one. So if you uh, look at if you define load as the probability that the system is busy, then in the general case, the load is the mean between the ratio lambda and mu and one. That is why uh, that's, that goes to the definition of the random neuron mode. Uh, neuron, uh, mode. No, this, one. this is exactly what leads to the random neuron definition. You take the MM1 and you add another flow of customers and you call the standard one positive customers and the other flow uh, is a flow of negative customers. I prefer to call them antimatter customers 
the dynamics to make it in one slide as said look at the look at the picture to understand the dynamics the sem semantic of the this stochastic this markov chain and uh, if you analyze this picture the behavior is the following when a uh, Positive customers behave as standard customers, and negative customers, when they arrive at a queue, they kill themselves and say the last customer in the queue. If there is nobody in the queue, they just disappear. That makes that you cannot observe negative customers, never. You can observe the consequences of the, the arrival of a negative customer. This is the mark of, um, the, the graph corresponds to the Markov chain defined by this dynamics, and this is exactly a random neural model when you change the vocabulary. Here you say a Q, and in the machine learning area you will say a neuron, and you will say here signals if you are in the, in the machine learning side, and you say that the neuron is activated when you say that the queue is busy, the math mathematics are the same. I think I put it. Yes. So the two things are exactly the same. Exactly the same. Use it in different ways. The, this is interesting in performance evaluation of networks. But here we use them as a neuron and we learn, we, we make uh, our application is on supervised learning using this thing. I will skip uh, some details about the the model. Um, and uh, as I, I said before, the the dynamics of this thing, controlled by a rational function, makes that it is very easy to do things like uh, accelerating the learning process by using the classic numerical procedures. You uh, use when you have a nice properties on the function you want to maximize or minimize. Here you will minimize a, a cost, a loss, but the, the hurt of the process is the, the rational function you have inside. Okay. Okay, a couple of words. We are currently working on two, mainly on two things in this model. One is to uh, polish what we have already done about the sensitivity, anal sensitivity analysis of this thing. That means computing derivatives, partial derivatives of any of the outputs uh, with respect to any of the inputs. And uh, that allows you, I, always pay, I will come back to this on, on our tool for two quality of experience applications. Another thing that is possible here is to invert somehow the mapping, the mapping input-output, uh, when the output is just a single scalar, which is the case in the Q or E application. And basically that means you, you, you are given a threshold and you will say for which uh, property of the input, the quality in the output will be at least the threshold you had. So you move from the output to the space of the input signal. So, quality of experience. Quality of experience is, in this application, the, the main component of what we call today quality of experience is uh, the perception the user has. You see, the, the user has of any application uh, YouTube, IP, telephony, video conferences, uh, going through the internet and perhaps suffering from any of the many phenomena that touch the quality, that uh, perturbates the quality of the signal. And uh, that happens in many technologies. So here, perceptual quality mainly is something subjective. There is no formal definition. You cannot, uh, it's not like a delay. A delay is T1 minus T0. It can be very hard to measure or very simple to measure, but conceptually there is no ambiguity in, in the meaning of that. 
and that's the same a loss rate, uh, the percentage of time during which the system is busy. All these kind of things are objectively defined. The, the perceptual quality lacks, uh, doesn't have a formal definition, of course. The problem is how to measure that. And people do that in industry using real humans. We call that a subjective testing session, looking at the uh, sequences, uh, choosing the quality in English, in French or Spanish, uh, ignoring numbers, and then the tool we use, the engineers analyzing the quality will convert those, num those evaluations into numbers, filter that using standard statistical techniques, and obtaining a number for the quality. Uh, I will show you just, just uh, here. These kind of things, for instance, are, uh, this is what the member of the panel will see. And the panel here, in this case, will convert these five levels into the numbers from one to five. Okay. Uh, of course, many people have tried to do this automatically. For instance, going to the pixels. Here is for two pictures, not two video sequences, but the same. And uh, comparing the pixels of the two images A and B, and uh, making a mean square error, a mean square difference, it doesn't work for for the perceptual quality thing. It is interesting and useful, but it's not easily correlated to perceptual quality, which is the goal here. And uh, we have this example with the big rabbit. Um, here is in the picture it was a perfect, a perfect one. We introduce it here, um, regular noise on the top. You see, you can see it. I hope. So this will be very poorly evaluated by humans. And uh, in this picture, we put the same noise, exactly the same, but on the this part of the picture, if I show you. In general, the two now, now knowing that the grass will be degraded, you see some very small difference. But here, people, every, humans have already this perfect. So looking at the pixels doesn't work. Um, let me skip this because I always like when I do this exercise. So we have a solution that we say, uh, well, a solution is automatic. It doesn't, we don't say that, it is automatic. There is no need, no need to go to the original signal. So we cannot, there is no need to make a diff between the two. It works in real time and we claim it is not only accurate, but you cannot do it better. Something to, I will not develop that, but we claim that statistically speaking, it is somehow optimal from the accuracy point of view. On the negative points, negative points, this is the reality. It is, it depends on the network. You change the network, you must build again your tool, your measuring thing. It depends on the application and the version of the application, the version of the network. It is a black box approach based on learning. So I will show you how we do that. Uh, you first, you select some metrics that you can measure objectively and which are related to quality, which is an a priori assumption. The result of the procedure will, can be, and it has been in, it has been done 10 times, more or less 12 times in industry. You can discover that one of the metrics you chose is not really correlated to quality. Um, and you divide it into classes, or you consider two types of metrics, those related to network, basically, and those related to the source of the flow. Example in video, historical example, the packet loss rate, the bit rate of the connection, and the frame rate, bit per second, frame, frames per second here. 
in voice over IP, the loss rate, the average size of the burst of losses, we call it MLBS, mean loss burst size, the bit rate, uh, if you know what is a FEC, the offset of the FEC. Let's move, and so on. It has been done many times, each time with different variables, depending on the application of the signal. I call it X here, and uh, I call a, a vector of values of those metrics a configuration, which lives in some space, and n variables, the product of n space, one for each of them. Um, and we postulate that the perceptual quality only depends on those. And uh, it, they don't depend, well, the, the perceptual quality, it doesn't depend on the uh, signal content in particular. So then, then you choose a few, let's say video, a few video sequences uh, corresponding to the, the, the subjective testing is very normalized. There are very norm, many norms. So you choose your norm and you uh, select a few sequences. I will say without looking at the slide, it will be faster. You take uh, 10 sequences, perfect ones. And for each one, you make 15 copies. Each one moving the variables in a platform. That's the hard part of the process where you can choose a bit rate, a frame rate, a loss rate, and so on. You obtain 15 copies of the same video sequence, but different quali quality levels, because some, in some cases you put a loss very high. Uh, if you look at voice over IP, you will play with the delay. And uh, you end with 150 sequences that you show to a panel. It's a typical number. A panel is 20 people, more or less. The panel will provide you the quality of those. You know the configuration, the, the values of the parameters. You have choose to, to build this 150 sequences. And you uh, use a learning tool to map the configuration with the quality coming from the humans in a standard learning process. That's PSQA. This is said here. Okay, this is the same. In this example, we had five variables. We fixed three of them. Doesn't matter, bit rate, I see here. I don't know if you can read. Frame, bit rate, frame rate, something technical in the three on the top. And then here, you have quality always in the vertical axis. M, O, S, mean. Opinion score is the standard name of these kind of things coming from video, so, sorry, for, from sound, high fidelity, when high fidelity arrived in the past. And here you have something related to the losses, to the joint, and it's something close to the mean loss burst size. And here is the loss. This is the it's a picture coming from the random neural network we used, and this is from MATLAB. And any engineer we, that uh, evaluated these kind of things said this is, this is consistent with what I know about this, this object. When you increase the losses, you smoothly decrease quality, and we touch. The other one is more difficult to understand. But this is uh, meaningless. This means that MATLAB needed more data to converge to something consistent. These are kind of things that happen that make us choose the random neural network. Okay. Let's see. What we are doing now is uh, adding a supervised learning at the beginning to make a more rational sh uh, choice of the sequences use it to calibrate the tool. And the two things I mentioned for random neural network, sensitivity analysis, which is the most important variable, something used in, in learning today a lot, and uh, the inversion thing. Okay. There are some references. The second topic is related to this one, 
this is Simon Terry's forecasting. And uh, we were interested uh, some years ago on, in this reservoir computing uh, family of tools. These are the references for the main two. But today, the people use, most, most people, perhaps all of the teams working, doing research in this area, use the, this EcoState network object. And uh, we, we do the same. Um, an EcoState network, so the typical example of this reservoir computing area, is a, run, is a neural network now, I'm speaking about any neural network, where you have some input here, these are the input neurons, the output ones here, and in the middle, a large part, much larger than the input in particular, the output is what you're interested in, it can be a scalar, just one neuron here, that's the case of PSQA, for instance. Um, but in the middle, you must have much more, uh, 10 times, for instance, the number of neurons here. And this is called the reservoir. The main particularity of this thing is that the reservoir doesn't learn. The learning process is done on the weight going to the output. The, we call that the readout here. So when you choose the weight of the connection between this neuron and that one, that weight is frozen forever. When you learn, you learn here. The point is, uh, in this reservoir, you typically have circuits in the graph, and uh, it is known and understood that um, this thing is good for predicting the future of a time series, the price of sugar in that market. Or uh, in networking, the throughput of my local area network tomorrow. Um, recurrences allows uh, to make that prediction much more easily than, uh, for instance, with a feed-forward structure. But they are harder to train. The learning processes has problems, let's say, different kind of problems. In this, in this architecture, the idea was to have circuits to use that property of the recurrent structures, the network, neural networks having circuits, but to learn on something here that in general is, is a simple regression, a linear one. Okay, but you can put anything, for instance, here you can put a feed-forward neural, random neural networks, things we do, where the flow goes from left to right. So it's very easy to train. So this is the ESN, and this is our version. We, we call it EcoState queue network, because it comes from queuing. And the only thing I want to show you is this. If you look at this thing, I didn't show it for for the, in the first part, because it is here. You have the output of neuron U in terms of what arrives at neuron U from any point in the network. And you, di we divide that in, in this sum here. You have, you have, uh, let me see where I put the notation. Okay, in any case, you have the input here, and here the, ne the neurons on the, the neurons on the input la layer of this reservoir based architecture. And here you have the output of the neurons in the reservoir. And the same on the denominator plus the rate of neuron U. So what What I have here is basically a random neural behavior where the output time is discrete. I forgot you have it here in red to simplify things, to simplify them a lot. Here you have the state of the reservoir 
one second before, one day before, one unit of time before. And here is the state of the input now. And that this gives you the output of any neuron, in particular of the reservoir, uh, at time t now. So this dynamic takes the properties we like in the random neural network area, but adapted to the ecostate network idea. So very quickly now, and the readout here in our experiment was the same. It's a linear regression. You see, here you have the output of the neurons in the reservoir, weighted by some number to go to the output of the network. This is a paper where this is described. And I put some few examples. I put the, the best ones, of course, in the slides, because the idea is to show that at least there are cases where this works very well. Of course, there are cases of this doesn't work, but in, for the moment, they are the same cases where the echo state network doesn't work. The countdown here I'm discovering is correct. Question, my question. I have 11 minutes. Upper bound. Yes. Oh, more. It's a low. Okay. Okay. So, uh, these, these examples come from very known benchmarks that are available on the internet and people use for testing variations on the tools and the publishing papers. Um, here you have the original one, and this is the predicted by the, our SQN tool. Of course, there are very nice forecasts here, but the, that's the point, the important point. We are working in a project these days with some people in the audience here, and uh, we didn't apply this tool to the sequences we have to analyze, but we expect them to be useless to predict things related to uh, extreme temperatures. But that's it. for the moment, nothing works for that. In the third topic, very quickly now, this is PowerPoint, um, is network tomography, which is another application it's a set of applications where we work. Um, the slides, I divided them in two parts, and I will only speak about the first part that uh, led to three publications uh, more or less recently at the beginning of the epidemics. And I will explain that these are the papers. Let me skip the marketing side. And I go to the problem. The problem is the following. You see there is a picture. You have a network. And you, uh, for different reasons, this is very critical now in what people call software-defined networks, which are networks implemented essentially using software because of the cloud, because of the speed of the hardware. It's the way networking is working today. Just software, basically. Um, so imagine you have a network like that one. You are interested in the delays uh, in, in each of the links of the network, but it's too expensive to go inside, to go link by link, to put a, a probe there. What you can do is to measure end-to-end to measure on the borders of the network. For instance, here, I, I see one, one, one. So links one, two, seven, one, two, seven. This is probably, probably the violet one. This is a path. I am able to measure the delay from this point to this point using this path. And I can do the same with path uh, 
link one, four, and six. One, four, and six. The colors are behind, probably. The red one is this one. So you measure the delays on a set of paths where you could put a probe, and you must deduce, infer, the value of the delays in the middle. That's the problem. So if you use this matrix, the paths here and the links there, this is the typical situation. You have, let's say, uh, 50 links, and you have money to put probes on 12 paths. So if you, the, the, the cho choosing the path is an optimization complex problem. Imagine somebody did that. So you have the path, you have the probes, and you have 12 path delays from which you must deduce the, how, I don't know how many I said, 50 links, the delay on 50 links. It's this kind of things. Um, with this, Notation here, one or zero, according to the fact that the link belongs or not to the path. You have, um, if you call Y, the delays on the paths, and X, the unknown, the delays on the links, Y is A times X. We neglect the noise in, the, in this approach. And it depends on, depending on the method, but to simplify, assume we ignore the, the, the noise we always have. So you have a linear connection between the input X and the output Y. You know Y and you want X, but the matrix is a rectangular, uh, with the number of columns much larger than the number of rows. So, so you have an infinite number of solutions if you use just that information. And what we did, basically, is, let me ignore these things. This is the composition. That you can decompose, in some cases, the problem into subproblems. But the main idea is, first, an evolutionary al uh, algorithm that works pretty well, where what you do is, like, a swarm, uh, or like in genetic algorithms, you, um, you choose an epsilon to control the error. You have some, you will have some x and you have a fixed y. That's your input data here. And uh, you will choose some small number there. You build a, a huge population of x. Or you sample x. According to a distribution, you discretize everything. And uh, you choose a uh, uniform signal, no? Okay. Um, you choose a distribution, the uniform one, for instance, an arbitrary one, of the uh, the dx. That is, look, let me look here. Alpha ij is the probability that uh, the link i has value j in a discrete, discrete version of the delays. Uh, you, have some, you have some small delta, and you count how many deltas you put for uh, for the different possible values of the unknown delays. So at the beginning, so you work with a distribution. You will output the distribution of x, not x. You can compute the average, for instance. But whatever, the median, whatever you want. The, the output of this will be the distribution of the individual delays. So you start by any, an arbitrary one, the uniform one. Then you sample one million copies of the, the original one and you select a subset of that satisfying this constraint. Think you have many. You use uh, something uniform. You will have some of them, uh, I don't know, 8% that satisfy this constraint. That's the new population. For those one, now you compute the distribution of that population, just counting how many, in how many cases the, the delay on link i has value j, or the jth value, divided by the size of the selected distribution, 
that is the ones satisfying the constraint. You have a new, a new alpha and you repeat. If there is no convergence, you decide that your epsilon was too small and you increase it and you try again. If you have convergence, then the epsilon is perhaps too large, so you divide it. That's basically the idea of the, this evolutionary thing. Let me, it, it works. These are some examples showing that it works. And uh, for the neural network case, it's extremely simple to understand. It is a typical inversion problem. So what we do is, we build, a, for instance, this simple uh, neural network. We have another version here. In the input, you put the, de the delays on the paths. And in the output, you put the delays on the links. The advantage is this, the data you is built by yourself. So you take your matrix A, you uh, you give to X one million values, you compute the Y's, and you put the Y's here, and the, the X's here, and you learn, you, you, you build a function, from the four paths to the six here, no, five here links, it's better to say, uh, 10 paths, 50 links. And you learn the mapping you have built uh, in the seconds before. And it works very nicely. And there are some results, I think, here. The important thing is that when you build your database tool for the training process, you can in, you can add other informations in general you have. For instance, lower bounds on the delays you are looking for, or some other component saying, or some correlation between what happens in two links, uh, whatever, and you build that in the, when you construct the, the when, you, when you build the database, the training database, and the result is very precise. You simulate your network and it works. And I think, I think I, I will stop here. At the end, there are, uh, and this is another topic. At the end, there are some references for this part too. Okay. So you have any question? Thank you, Gerardo, very much for the presentation. Anyone in the public who wants to make any question? Otherwise, well, I, you, Uh, I was curious about the the evolutionary algorithm that you use. Oh. What what uh, uh, genetic operators are genetic operators or sorry sorry say it again. Uh, uh, what uh, genetic operators do you use? There are, it's not a genetic uh, a genetic algorithm. It's ah, okay. similar to okay. because you have a population that you will make you will make. Uh, from which we build a, a sequence of. But what you, what you do is simply, um, you start by initial, no, here, an initial distribution, an arbitrary one, or something that you know is close to reality, whatever, and then you, you filter here. This is your, the way you select the, the, the good ones. You have a, for instance, uniform one, you sample, you obtain one million X. Some of them will satisfy this. Y is known. A is known, and epsilon you have fixed something, point one. Then there are some of the X, of course, some of X will satisfy the inequality. If not, something is wrong there. Perhaps the epsilon is too small, or perhaps the number of the size of the population is too small. So you, in general, it's very easy to have a population where a significant part satisfies the constraint. So you kill the rest. And from that one, you go to, it's an expectation maximization algorithm, if you, if you know that. It's basically that idea. It comes from that, what we did. Uh, the inspiration if EM. So, uh, you, you build a new one and you continue like that. So it converts in general. For the moment, we never found a 
case where it doesn't convert. We, we start with a, for an epsilon, uh, an epsilon, a uh, large one. And then you start to divide. And there is a point where you work too, too, too small. So you stop. Thank you. In the cell, in the same line, uh, Gerardo, you said that the, that the evolutionary algorithm has, it, it was okay, something like that, you said, the results. Are you planning to keep using it or maybe trying different weight parameter? What it's, what do yes. you have in mind? Something I could, I forgot. Um, the thing is, from the accuracy point of view, the winner is machine learning for in our tests. But it's not exactly the same output. Here you get the distribution. And you have the distribution, you can do more things. You look at that as a random object, of course, but you can, for instance, print the mean value. But you can play with the distribution and answer more, much more difficult questions. In the machine learning thing, we wanted to obtain the value of the delays. You have the equation AX equals Y, which is in the undetermined case. You want to provide a possible point X. So it's not the same. But if you look at the, the cost in time and the accuracy, the winner is in, in fair conditions, the machine learning approach for inverting the, the, the for solving the inverse problem. Um, I got it. Thank you. But um, what about the, you said at some point it's hard or simple to, to measure the delay. Right? And why is that? Why sometimes ah. it's hard or simple? It's about the, uh, because it's expensive or? Yeah, it, there are many reasons. SDNs, if you look at the, because that's another area where the team is very active. I work also on that, but on the thing I eliminated from the talk. Placement, reinforcement learning. In this SDNs, one of the interesting things with SDN is that you can you can make the network to adapt, to move, to change dynamically very quickly because it's software. In the real world, you in the, in the past, you had to go there and change machines and configure things. Here, you do everything by software. So the thing is, in in some cases, 5G, 6G, extremely dynamic, slicing, if you know this kind of technique. So, uh, going there to the links is hard. It's hard because of the, the way that the network is changing, the topology is changing. Um, there is a second reason, which is that in many cases, the owners of the, what is inside, you have more than one. So to go there, you must ask. You need to be able to put something inside the network that takes time, money, and, uh, in some, in some cases, you, the answer is no. But the borders, you always have them. So the people use a lot these kind of things. They, in general, the area, not necessarily what we did. But there are many. So for that reason, uh, which is called tomographies, hot now in research. Okay, thank you very much. And I have, I have a question. Um, you mentioned the machine learning approach works better than the evolutionary samples in terms of the final solution. Do you think, did you research about if that was uh, due to the fact that the reinforcement learning does a better exploration of the solution domain than the evolutionary sampling, or is it, was it more of a convergence problem? And you said why it is, it works better, basically. I didn't get the, the second part of the, yeah, the question. If, if it was more related to the exploration of the solution domain, or if it was an issue on the, on the models themselves? Um, I don't know exactly why. Um, you can do a, a complexity analysis of both things, seen as algorithms, after all. You can understand what is happening from the complexity point of view, but it's a matter of uh, what you observe. Uh, it is no, there is no uh, reinforcement learning here. There is no uh, direct exploration of a state space. 
it, it is you have a problem, you have y you know, x you don't know, but you have an equation you can that for which you have no inversion. So from one side you, you use this kind of thing, which is uh, em if you know that, or close to the genetic idea, make a, evolve a population, or machine learning is just uh, try to give me the input as a function of the output, and you and you look at that, and there is no problem, and it all it always works. Uh, the main the reason why it was better no is too uh, too hard a question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have a last question, sure. not that related to the technical aspect, but maybe for a political decision. When you show the, those two images, right, with the pixels in the top and then in the bottom, when you consider, are consider the 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 weight of the those pixels, wrong pixels, the the same weight if the pixel is in the middle of the image or in a corner, for instance. Um, we explored a little bit that. We went to, we discussed with, uh, France Telecom. They are in France. Orange today. They said that they had algorithms, that there exist algorithms, probably not for, made by Orange Labs, where you can identify the part of the image where your eyes will go. There are trivial examples. If you look, if the, the image comes from uh, the news, the television, you have a, or, a, or a movies by Woody Allen, you have the faces all the time, and our eyes go immediately to the faces. There are other cases where it's hard. But the, when we discuss it about that, the, um, our goal is to do real-time evaluation of quality. And you needed more time to analyze than the transmission time, than the, than the play out time. So it's nice, but we could not apply. And then, uh, you can not, it's difficult to do better than that. That works, and uh, they show you the picture, and you know, uh, there is a kind of uh, yellow marker around the important part, according to the algorithm. In general, it was correct. And it's correct enough to concentrate there and look at the pixels there. So probably one day, when the time will be, perhaps two days, can be faster than the play out. You, you, must, you must use, I don't know, 25 frames per, per second for a human eye of 30 frames. So if you can do faster than that, it's perhaps something that can be competitive here. But it doesn't, I don't know. I, I haven't seen any approach based on that. There are perhaps some other drawbacks. Gerardo, third, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, well, thank you from all of us. Thank you. So right now we are going to to move to the to the first in-person session number five. Leandro Silva is going to present the work entitled A Legal Information System for Intelligent Sentence Mining Applied to Civil Law. Hello. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Leandro, and I'm going to present the paper A Legal Information System for Intelligent Sentence Mine Applied to Civil Law. Uh, this work is a uh, result as a, a partnership between the University of Pernambuco and the Neural Law. There is a startup that aims to bring AI and other computer techniques to the law field. So we are going to follow a typical presentation, introduction, and some background 
We are going to present the system, evaluate it, and then finally conclusions. So for the introduction, uh, the legal process, uh, it has many steps, uh, many uh, complex set of procedures. There are many types of documents and several decisions can be handed uh, down through the, the process. Uh, for instance, we have here a, a flow chart of the Brazilian civil process. Uh, it is just as illustrative, I will not talk about it. But in, in orange, we have a first degree sentence uh, decision, the first final decision. Then uh, it can have uh, some appealing and a second degree decision. It, it can go on until the, the Supreme Court. So extracting these informations from the decision is very important for automation tasks for law firms. Uh, it is about uh, giving some freedom to the humans to do some more creative work instead of uh, do some mechanical work that machines can do. Yeah. So, but it is not so so easy to do this because uh, the legal documents has some extensive textual elements and even for humans in some cases it's hard to, to, to extract the information. So our goal is to develop a, a tool, we name it MIS, uh, mining intelligent system. Actually, in Portuguese, it is mineração inteligente de sentenças. So, uh, it, the the this tool is about to classify the documents of first degree sentence, and then extract some information, uh, the decision, the name of the judge, the values of the decision, the legal ground, uh, what's the reasoning about this decision, and if it had some obligations to do. Okay. Our current scope is that, is that we deal with documents in Portuguese okay, and from civil law and state justice. Okay. So, some theoretical foundations. First of all, what is a sentence? Uh, a sentence is a pronouncement by the judge that extinguishes the execution of the, the process. In, in Brazil, we have a, a, a law that structures a, uh, a sentence in three sessions. Okay. We have a report, then a fundamentals, and the provision conclusion. It, it's mandatory that a sentence has this, these three sessions. Uh, we also use uh, some deep learning approach. Uh, uh, right now, uh, deep, learning, uh, deep learning's applications on natural language processing are very popular. We have some large models with uh, state-of-the-art results. And it's hard to train those models with less data. Uh, that's our, our case. But there is a, a methodology named Multifit uh, that proposes a, a strategy to dealing with it. We first train a, a general, a general feature extractor and ensemble with uh, Wikipedia data. And then we fine tune it to classify our target data set. Uh, we also use some ontology. There is a formal specification that where we we structure it, the the knowledge in terms of uh, concepts, properties of those concepts, and relationships, and then we allow it to perform some uh, inferences and extract some information. So this is our, our flow chart. It's not so clear, but uh, uh, we combine three approaches. We have machine learning, deep learning, we have some rule-based, mainly uh, regular expression, and we have the ontology. In order to, to reach our goal, we had to use all those. So, uh, first of all, we receive a publication, that's a document, we don't know what it is. Okay. And we then use some rules to extract the conclusion, the provision section. With the conclusion, we can use deep learning to classify if it is a sentence or not. If it is a sentence, then we extract some more information using uh, a regular expression and classify the, the foundation, the legal ground of the decision using also deep learning, machine learning. And finally, 
uh, we use the ontology to extract the obligations to do. So the rule basis stage is just a set of regular expression. In here, you have some uh, some cloud of words uh, in free translated. Of course, we search for these words in Portuguese. Uh, the deep learning stage, we have first the sentence classifier. Uh, we use an architecture of uh, four quasi recurrent neural networks. And for this classifier, we use a, a data set with 1800 documents, 68% uh, sentence, 31 nodal types. And we split this database and uh, with 10% for, for tests. Uh, in this data set, our results are 92.9% accuracy. But I will show you some more results with a, a, a real test data set. And the foundation classifier, we had 34 possible foundations in our database. But uh, it's very unbalanced. And most of the foundation, we have one or two examples. So we combined the uh, strategy to 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 classify all the 34 uh, possible foundations. First, we use a deep learning approach to classify the the most frequent, because we have a data set that we could say if it is that obligation or not. This if it is this foundation or not. This foundation is proper improper billing. Okay? And if it is not, now we have uh, many other options. Uh, but we we use the non-parametric class classifier. We vectorize the text and find in the search in our database what is the most similar text with this. And the most similar text with this will have probably the same foundation. Uh, so it's uh, uh, k nearest neighbor with cosine similarity. Okay? And for this, we we reach a 63 percent accuracy. And finally, the, the ontology model stage that we find the obligations to do. Uh, the obligations to do would be something like uh, uh, pay something to, to, the, the, to the people who, who started the, the legal process or something like this. Okay. Uh, we have seven, seven types of obligation. Huh? And for this, uh, our, our ontology was modeler. For each of those types of applications, we had a, a, a structure that represents what are the concepts, what are the relationship, relationships between them. This is a, an, an example for one type. And finally, our evaluation. For this, we received a, a real data set from a law firm with a little more than 54,000 documents, but it is a real data set. So we have a lots of missing and wrong labels in, on it. Actually, there is some human error on this because imagine there is a very uh, repetitive task. You take a document, you read it, then you put in some form, what is the name of the judge and something like that. So. Uh, for instance, we have uh, 33,000 sentences, but only 16,000 judges' names. So the the people don't feel every information every time. Okay? Uh, we actually report some metrics over this data set on the, the paper. But in this presentation, I'm going to show a qualitative assessment uh, because we randomly choose uh, 50 sentences, we classify it, then we send it back to the law firm so the lawyers could analyze our results. And for this 50 random, random sentences, we achieve 96% accuracy on judge's name, 86 on decision, 94 on four values extracted. Uh, we extract the value and classify it, and 50% for foundations. And for this, we, we kind of reach it in a difficult problem, even for humans. Uh, 
for instance, we have some labels that are really close, undo collection recognized, unproven, undo in charge, what is, when to classify each one, okay? and 9% accuracy for obligations. Uh, right now, this, this system is deployed. It is processing something about 2,000 of documents per day. And in a, in a few months, maybe we will we will we'll have more more results. So our conclusion is this: that is that the first conclusion is that to to achieve our goal, we had to use multiple strategies. So rule based deep learning uh, ontology. Each task uh, has a, a better tool to perform it. Uh, our results suggest that this system can contribute to to this automation in, in law firms. Uh, we performed a qualitative analysis on 50 randomly sentences and the results uh, compared to, to manual feeling, compared to the error that we found in the, in the data set that we received. It, it, we think that our, our, our work is is some improvement. We have a limitation because we didn't find any 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 other work to compare our results. So maybe this work can be uh, a baseline for others. So we could compare other techniques and other strategies. And for this, there is a a, a huge problem that there is a public data set. We have a, a, a data set that's private. It has private information. It has some labels that we could not uh, make it available. But we have some, some pieces of this data set that I think that we can uh, make it available, like the foundation database. Because the foundation is, is a, a text about the, the, the law. It's not about a, a person or some uh, private information. And we we aim to to make it available, and we have lots of improvements to do in the the classifier model, mostly by uh, validating and and expanding the training database. We are using very small training database, and also we we intend to expand it to other areas of the law. This work is only about the civil law. Uh, we are actually working with other area, there's labor law, but we may uh, expand it to other areas as well. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Has anyone have a question? Leandro? If not, I, I have a, a couple of questions for you. First of all, you showed a process where this is a sequential process, right? Do you have the chance to, to group some steps or do it in a parallel way or something? Or is at some point you cannot handle it? Yes, we can do it in a parallel way. Uh, as soon as we classify if that is a sentence, we can perform everything in a parallel way. If I know that the document's a sentence, all the information that I want to extract, I can do it in parallel. Okay, thank you. And and then you you mentioned that you don't have enough that data for, to use deep learning. Maybe that's why MIS is better than using, or at least had better results, right? And uh, how many data do you think you need in order to use deep, deep learning? Uh, based on the result from the sentence classifier, where we had 2,000 documents, I think that for a binary problem of this this kind, it is roughly enough 2,000 documents. Uh, for the foundation classifier, uh, we had, uh, it's not clear here, but we had little less than 300 documents for one kind and 300 for others. And so, in, we also trained a deep learning classifier that was this first one here, oh. with 8% accuracy. So, uh, I would say, that it's a, it's a guess, 
that something about uh, 2000 documents is safe for training this kind of model with this kind of architecture. And, and did you try using uh, another percentage for testing? Because you are using that 10%, right? See. Did you try different parameters or percentage? Actually, for deploying, we we did not reserve the for the the model that we deployed. We used the full database for for training. Okay. Uh, but we also train uh, lots of different models and different strategies. And the, what we are using right now is what we 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 found is the best. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, right now we are going to move on with the next presentation. I don't know if uh, Helder Gomez is here. Yeah. Please meet you. Uh, Helder, please take the microphone and the pointer. You can use uh, this step in the mark in the floor. Okay. And the, the presentation is going to be in the screen, and you can point, use the pointer over the screen. Okay. Uh, Helder is going to present the the work entitled "Applying Non-Compensatory Multi-Criteria met, me, uh, Methods to Build Better Life Index Countries Ranking." You have 15 minutes for the presentation, and then five minutes for questions. Hi everybody, my name is Elder. I will present the, the, the paper Applying No Compensatory Multi-Criteria Method to Build the Better Life, Better Life Index Countries Ranking. This work is uh, based on the dissertation of Graus Azevedo, a uh, student of mine at the Universidade de Fluminense. I'm also a member of, of the INCT de Fonciene Piqui. Oh. Uh, the outline is uh, I talk about uh, some, some, a bit about uh, non-compensatory versus compensatory method, better life index, and then after it I will apply the non-compensatory. I show the apply of non-compensatory ranking to BLI data set. First, let's talk about a bit uh, about uh, out ranking and the versus additive models. Uh, out rank non-compensatory. And the additive compensatory mode. I will take an example to choose, of choosing two kits to compose a computer. Um, the, these kits has, have, uh, uh, the variables here is the hard disk memory, the webcam, and the keyboard. And the, each kit has scores of performance in each one of these criteria. So, if you use the additive approach, we we could do something like this. Uh, we transform non as zero, yes as one, and after it you should sum the the values, getting these these results. Uh, kids A and D, we have values five uh, terabytes webcam. Uh, nine six terabytes and the value of keyboard zero. This uh, I call attention for this point because uh, we can't we can't sum the values okay, uh, of the pixels of the cams. We can use only one cam each time, so we can't use the some of these values because uh, and the, you also 
because this uh, this variable is you can you deal with this as an additive one. What you can do uh, you can deal with the the, the second variable as an additive one. We can have the max value from the two ones that you choose, and uh, we can't. Presentation goes. I'm trying to come to come back to the presentation. Oh my! How can I come back? The other. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in additive model, we also sum the values of the uh, HD, each one of the variables. So you uh, have to sum the values in the green cell. Uh, these, var these values are not uh, correct because we can't sum the, uh, the value of a keyboard with a very term and the, it will with uh, the, the, the hard disk memory. Uh, even if you normalize the, the values, we can't use this because they have different meaning. Okay. So, uh, another way as an alternative for the situation when we can't use uh, compensatory or we can't use additive modes, we can use a mode to choose for example, the uh, the kids B and B have these values. In this, they are not looking for the maximum value. We're looking to cover the variables, to better cover the variables, to outrank the values. So these models are uh, colored as outrank models. About the better life index. Better life index is an indicator and needs to evaluate counties, the, the well being in counties. They can support organizational, government, or even personal decision. It's provided by OSCD. Uh, first appeared in 1960s, and uh, it has mixed, uh, 24 criteria and that are organized into 11 dimensions. The index is going to weight sum. Weight sum is a bit additive function. So, uh, this is a piece of the graph of the life index. It's a Frauer graph. If the uh, Frauer uh, represents a, a county, one county. For and the, the length of the petal represents the score in the, one of the on top or dimensions in the better life index. So, uh, for example, in Japan, uh, housing, we can see that housing conditions has a greater score than working balancing, working life balancing, and it, that's greater than civic uh, engagement. Uh, so, yes, these are the scores of the better life index for Japan, for example. And the flower has uh, different sizes according to the, the score in each uh, criteria or each variable. So, uh, I get the better life index uh, produces uh, a graph like this one. In the position is assigned to the, to the index. So, for example, for Korea is, has an uh, index greater than Brazil that has an uh, uh, index greater than Mexico. So, uh, we can, uh, this index uh, aggregates all the values. All the, the performance, all the scores in the in a unique value to uh, weight sum to additive mode, to additive mode. This 
there. Is where C. What is the problem? Uh, a low performance in an index can be compensated by a higher performance in other ones. So, in other words, a poor performance of a county in a, in a topic can be compensated, can be hidden by a higher performance in, a, in other variable. So, we can, uh, uh, can hide the poor performance. Okay. To use a non compensatory method uh, to aggregation uh, at the, instead of the way to bring it mean. They use the primitive, primitive two method that was proposed by Burns, Wink, and Marshall in 1986 when they were published in the European Journal of Place Research. Two are the equations of the primitive. First of all, we for the, the performance of each instance of each county in, under each criterion, because they we build a preference function and they after which we produce a preference index and we produce and in the sequence we produce we get got, uh, the flu, the positive flu, the negative flu and the net flu. And the next tool is used to rank the top. A fine committee should be able to get the get the BL data, counts, or the counts, or the criteria, or the score, compute the preference function, the index, and the flu, and get the counts. The data we collect from the OECD stats, the page of the OECD stats, with 38 counties, 24 indications, and the data we collected in December 2019, that is before the COVID. COVID. And we prefer to use the indicators instead of the topics in this presentation. The counties I show here, and there are uh, a set of counts, there are members of the OECD, and the three counties that are invited Brazil, uh, Brazil, uh, South America, South, uh, South Africa. And the Indian, these are the criteria and the weight of the criteria provided by the OCD that the data set. We apply in two ways, uh, taking criteria weights into account and the, uh, discarding, dropping this, the, the weights. There are no difference in the, the results uh, using the weights. And, uh, or start with. Here is the ranking. Uh, I, I cut the, uh, the, the results. I'm showing uh, a set of results and then uh, comparing the results. There's no there is no correlation among the results with the uh, weight. This could not be really to consider that there is, uh, that method applies to deal with the rank. It does not matter. But uh, for this particular, if you go for this particular that data set, it is partially, partially correct. Because if we take a look in the top five, for example, looking for the, the find, this five, the top five counties in the OI, we get this result. Uh, there is a little change in the third group points, but uh, Canada that uh, appears as one of the uh, 
get the peers, we will know here why uh, it's one of the top five is not the peers in the Prometheus group, and the Sweden appears in Prometheus, two top five in the, uh, the, uh, in the places uh, of the Canada. Well, I have difference, little difference, but a difference in the position of the top five. Because also in the last, the top, the top bottom, the, the bottom five. But I show, show here only this uh, top five. So, you can, if you want, uh, want to choose the community, you can access this useful document. This is APT. And then the code uh, of the summit of the ranking app. Okay, it's available at hiropoepp.com. And next step is to uh, cluster the data using a uh, machine learning uh, method. And this after this, after this, the, the success, uh, ranking the success, the, the cluster, the category, the category generated by the system. Another thing that we are, we are working is in optimization, integrated optimization, is the clustering, sorting, and the auto ranking metrics. Uh, we are now working in this. Gracias. Thank you. Obrigado. Valente. Bojiva. Questions? Hello. Thank you very much for your presentation. Does anyone have any question for Hilda? In that case, someone? Okay. I was wondering when you compare the, in the top five, Comparing the both methods, uh, do you know the the gap that provoked that made the difference in the in the ranking? It's a great gap, or 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 maybe it's yes, that's not a great gap. It's not great gap. It's uh, the gap was inspired before the user uh, another. How do we need to analyze the data to apply the whole data? But uh, there is not a uh, great uh, gap among these in the top five. The gap is uh, among the other in the set of the 38,000. We can also think that, uh, that uh, uh, there are only 28 Counts analyzing the CD very like in that. Uh, and if the count has a around the 200 counts, so fairly there are so much counts that are not analyzed by the CD very like in that. Okay. Thank you very much Thank for your you. presentation again. Okay, right now, I don't know if we have the, we have a special, uh, from you there. So maybe we can move to the coffee break then, and we can start the, the next session at 11. Thank you, see you in a, in a few minutes.
Okay, let's start with the session number six. In this case, we I am introducing Martin Pedemonte, who is going to present the work entitled Scheduling of the Uruguayan Football and Basketball Leagues. Martin. Thank ahead. you. Thank you, Gaston. Uh, well, this work uh, has been known as a part of the undergraduate uh, title of Computer Engineering by uh, Martin Lago, Nicolás Lantian, and Santiago Rodríguez. And also, uh, uh, it worked with us, uh, Federico De Franco, that is uh, a teacher assistant here at the university, but also is a journalist, a sports journalist. So he was very interested in trying to work in this problem. Well, uh, football and basketball are the most popular sports in Uruguay, as, as you can see during the, the World Cup. Uh, and well, um, it, it's important to have tournaments that are sporting fair and to attract audiences both to the stadium and to the television transmissions. So the goal of this project was to uh, generate methodology, tools, uh, that would help uh, the decision makers to make better fixtures for the tournaments and to encourage the use of optimization uh, optimization problem approaches for these kind of problems. Um, well, uh, fixtures uh, nowadays are made based mostly on patterns that were designed. Nobody knows who designed the patterns. And there are just uh, uh, a random choose of the teams, and, and the patterns are inst instantiated for those teams. Um, we can see that in, in real world uh, fixtures from the Uruguayan leagues, there are uh, some problems. 
Uh, for instance, uh, first we can consider the breaks or the number of breaks. Um, uh, we define uh, a break as a se sequence of consecutive games that are played either at home, that, that, that's the ones that are called home breaks, or away, uh, that are called away breaks. Uh, here we, we have an example from the basketball uh, league in Uruguay from the tournament 2020-2021. In the match day uh, five, uh, Biwa uh, played home in their stadium. And then in match day six, they played again in their, in their, in their stadium. That's a, that uh, is relevant for, for the fixture because they, they play, there's more uh, attendance from the local team, from the home team, uh, the, the, the space for, for, for away teams, uh, attendance is reduced. So there's, we can consider there's a little advantage when you play home instead of when you play away. So if you have several games in a row playing home, it can be, advantage for that team. In the basketball league, there are like uh, teams that play four, uh, four uh, that they have home breaks of four and also of away. Then we can consider the carryover effect that the, it, the idea that try to reflect this, uh, this measure is that the performance of a team uh, can be affected by the previous match that uh, have played with other teams. Uh, for instance, if a team plays with a very strong team, uh, the players can suffer from fatigue, uh, they can get injured, and then in the next game, those players won't be able to, to play. If we take a look at the fixture of the football championship in 2021, for instance, in uh, match day three, Peñarol plays with Boston River, and then Boston River plays with Montevideo City Torque on match day four. If we take a look at match day four, Wonder, uh, Wonders plays with Peñarol, and then in the next uh, match day, Montevideo City Torque plays with Wonders. Uh, Montevideo City Torque always plays with the teams that in the previous uh, match day have played with Peñarol. Peñarol is one of the traditional and most historic teams from Uruguay, has a, a large number of fans, and, and it's considered one strong team. So Montevideo City Torque always plays with teams that are uh, that, that have previously played with a very strong team. And you can see it. In, in, in the in the next match day, it's always the same. Peñarol Rentistas in match day five, and Rentistas Montevideo City Torque in match day six. So you can see the pattern clearly there. Um, so it's, we have a problem there. Well, uh, I will comment some issues about related works, then the model that we have developed for the Uruguayan Championships, uh, how we deal with this problem using NC, NCGA2 and comment something about numerical results and some conclusions. Well, uh, we made an extensive literature review. There are several interesting works uh, from Europe, from Australia, and also here from the region. Uh, especially from Celso Ribeiro from Brazil and Guillermo Duran from Chile. And in particular, there is a very interesting work that was developed from the people from Guillermo Duran in Chile and the fixture for the South American World Cup qualifiers for Russia uh, 2018 was, uh, was uh, instantiated uh, from algorithms that they designed that take account the number of away breaks in the, the, the match on the qualifiers. I'll play uh, two games on a row and in, in fixtures from previous uh, World Cup qualifiers, 
teams play uh, they have home breaks or away breaks in, in, in that sequence of two games that, that were placed in that were played in the same window um, and now with the with the new fixture developed that doesn't happen anymore um, and also a, a, a concern for most teams in South America was that don't play consecutive games versus uh, Argentina and Brazil that are two very strong teams. So if you, in a window you have a match with Argentina with Brazil, uh, most teams will get zero point. Okay. And, and this, uh, this work uh, were uh, very important and inspired part of our work. Um, but we have a problem that most of these works model the problem as the travel tournament problem, that is NLP hard. But the idea of the traveling tournament problem is that you, you have your set of team and you want to minimize the total distance traveled by each of the teams. So you don't want that teams have to travel uh, a lot of distance because they have to go to a zone and then come back and go and come back. And they, in, for instance, in Chile, when they, when they travel long distance, they try to have uh, a couple of games in that region that they are playing. Huh? Uh, uh, besides uh, minimizing the distance, also try to avoid long home stands and road trips. The problem here in Uruguay is that this approach can be applied directly to the Uruguayan ch Championship because most of the teams are located in Montevideo. So the travel distance is not relevant for this problem. We have uh, in the current tournament, 13 of the teams are located in Montevideo. Uh, this image I get from internet is a bit old. These are not the teams that are playing in current tournament, but it's representative of the teams that in general play. And as you can see, it, this was, I think, this is from 2016. Only two teams are located away from Montevideo, and the Travel this the, the the longest travel distance is five five hours. So we develop a, a model particular for for the Uruguayan League. We take in account uh, some general uh, constraints that regard the the use of a round robin schedule. Uh, for instance, uh, a team cannot play a match against itself. Each team has to play once again each of the rest of the teams, and each team only has to play one game in a match day. And then we incorporated like five more restrictions that are particular from all leagues that includes uh, that you cannot play games in a row uh, with, um, with top teams. Um, I don't know, Nacional and Peñarol cannot play uh, in the first match of the tournament to make it more attractive. Nacional and Peñarol are uh, is, uh, uh, the two biggest teams in, in Uruguay. Uh, well, an and additional restriction that can be seen in the, in the, here at the slide. And our goal was to minimize the number of breaks and have a balance between uh, the benefits that a team can get from the carryover effect. You know? We don't want that um, a team uh, always sees benefit from a carryover effect and other teams no. We want to balance that value. That taking account uh, for the carryover effect, the strong teams of the, of the league. So, um, uh, first of all, we have to define a representation for this problem. Uh, we use uh, what is known as the polygon method that allows to, to make a, a, a round robin schedule. Uh, basically, uh, we have to uh, put, uh, put the teams on a polygon and then uh, rotating the names of the teams generates uh, um, a schedule that uh, allows that each team plays one uh, match 
in uh, in a in a match day and that plays with different teams in all the different uh, match days. Um, the problem with the polygon method is that uh, always generates the same fixture, so we have to incorporate in the structure um, other uh, other aspects uh, in our representation, uh, so we can uh, make like a logical a logical mapping between that polygon that we generated and the teams that we were uh, instantiating that schedule. So we have a matrix for home and away matrix, and the, loca the logical ma mappings for teams and match days. But because you can see here that in the match day one, this picture always give the same matches. If we want that those matches are in the match day four, we have to swap between them. For those, we have this structure, this additional structure, allow us to, to, to manage those, those logical mappings. Well, we have a, we use a similar approach to Wild and Kendall, and we have to develop some mutation, especially designing mutations, uh, taking into account these, uh, these additional structures that we have considered. Basically, basically we change, uh, some home and away, uh, we invert some home and, home and away values. We exchange the fixture of two teams, and we exchange also match days. In the, in the other points, the, the 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 approach that we follow is the same as uh, while. Okay. Uh, well, as as I said, our goal was to balance the uh, Our goal was to balance. The number of breaks and the number of break of each type, so you don't have too many home breaks and you don't have too uh, many uh, away breaks, and also to balance the carryover effect between the teams. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, begin by lo take a look at, at, at current fixtures from basketball league and football championship um, that involve 12 teams in in one year, 14 teams uh, in basketball league and 16 in the in the football championship here you can see the number of breaks that each of the tournament have the, the theoretical uh, value the the minimum value of the number of break is n uh, minus 2 so in a, in in this tournament with 12 and 14 teams the number of breaks should be 10 and 12 and the real number is 34 and 45. That's what we have seen when we look at the patterns of the games. And the football championship um, presents the real values, uh, the, the minimal values of the number of breaks. Um, also, the best value of the carryover effect can be calculated, but it's a bit complex. I, I, won't, I won't enter in details. Uh, and here, um, in in the football championship, the value is around uh, two thousand, and the and, and the and the real value of the tournament is more than six hundred, and also in the carryover, the the carryover effect in the basketball league is is better than in the football championship. We can see that it seems that the pattern for the basketball league takes into account more the carryover effect and doesn't care about the breaks. And in the football league, it's the other is the other way. It takes into account the number of breaks, but doesn't care about the career. That's what it seems. Looking at the at the different fixtures. So we, I'm running out of time. We we use um, uh, as as I said, a multi genetic algorithm, and we get the Pareto fronts. But we were more interested in in in. In, in considering particular decisions, we take into account uh, the decisions that minimize one of the goals and the point that is closer to the ideal solution. If we consider those results, uh, the, the results we obtain, and also the, um, the uh, an integer programming approach that we consider. Um, 
the in the case of the basketball league, the solutions that we found are far superior than the real fixtures in many cases and in with the integer programming approach we were able to reach to to the minimum number of breaks and carry over but um uh, as you can see with the multi objective we were able to to reach the same values but also to improve the other goal no? that uh, the 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 exit method uh, was wasn't taking in, into account the other goal also in the second example is exactly the same we were able to reach the optimal values uh, and um, it presents uh, the multi objective approach uh, a better value in the in the other goal that is not considered by the integer programming approach also the balanced solution is like a trade off between uh, the different goals and can also be considered and as, as I said previously, uh, in the football league, the problem is with the carryover effect. The number of breaks is perfect. They, they get the minimal value, but they don't care about the carryover effect and the solutions that we can find. Um, in, in this case, we, uh, the integer programming approach was not able to reach to, to the optimal values. I uh, think that uh, we left it uh, three days of computing using Gurobi and they were not able to reach the optimal values, but um, we obtained the optimal values with the multi-objective. Uh, I think that it was like five or six hours of computation. Um, and also, uh, we can see that the the balance uh, solution also are interesting because uh, allows us to balance both both of the objectives. Uh, Well, some conclusions. Um, the result that we obtained shown an improvement over current real world fixtures. Uh, the multi objective approach is able to find solutions that balance both of the obje objectives, uh, even in uh, scenarios where single objective optimal values um, were obtained with integer programming. Multi objective approach can provide improvements in the other objective. And, well, the, the main ideas that we have, and since one of the uh, of the people that developed this this study is a sport journalist, is to try to interact with the Uruguayan Football Association and try to discuss the results obtained to see if it is interesting for them to balance these goals or to maybe to study another goals that could be interesting for the teams, and we think that also this. This work can help to encourage the use of optimization techniques in the creation of fixtures in Uruguay. In, in other leagues, there are many amateur leagues here that may, that the fixture is done just by random chosen the teams with a pattern. And in many cases, those are not uh, optimal or good solutions. Uh, so we think there's a, a way to, to continue with this work. But we need uh, feedback from from the people that designed the tournaments to take into account their their, their per perspective. Well, that's all. I take a few minutes more. Thank you, Martin, for your presentation. Do you have any question for Martin? Oh. No? Okay, Martin, I was, actually you answered my question at the, the the last part of the, your presentation regarding the the national uh, association Uruguayan Football Association, uh, but do you think they will present maybe extra restriction or constraint? For instance, political uh, constraint regarding the maybe you cannot play uh, two teams cannot play be cannot be playing at the same time because of the police situation or something like that. Yeah. All, all that aspect can be considered. We, we have developed, uh, some more sophisticated models, but we, for instance, taking into account, uh, with day in the week, the game is played. So, um, uh, because of the television, so every match can, 
but for instance, we have not decided uh, which games are more attractive to be put in which days, and all this aspect can be uh, put into the model. Then maybe it's a bit difficult, uh, but I think that maybe the the, the league can do it uh, to measure. Uh, okay, which games should be put on Sunday? Which, but uh, but. That there are many in, in the in the literature. There are many other goals that ca that can be considered, but is that you need feedback from the other side, saying, well, what's more important for us is this aspect or this or this other is not important. But I think that uh, it's an, it was amazing for me during this project to note that a team always plays against the team. That plays with Peñarol. It was like, and nobody realizes this. Looking do, do, at the, do you and think it I'm was? A, I'm a football fan, and I don't realize that about it. It was like, it caught my attention too. And uh, do you think it was on purpose? Or no, or no. Not? I think that the pattern was developed for minimizing the number of breaks, and it's uh, uh, the, the the teams that instantiate the, the the fixture are chosen randomly. So it could be Peñarol from it could be a, any other team. another. And do you have the chance to check uh, the model using this year tournament because it's already it's done finished? Uh, no, no. The, the project was uh, developed uh, during 2022. 21. Uh, during, no, I think. Oh yeah, during twen during 2021. So we have not considered 2022. It would be nice to to check that. It was really interesting. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Okay, uh, guys, right now we are going to to start with uh, another presentation. Uh, here, ah, you already have the, mm -hmm. the, micro the, the microphone. Okay, uh, Diego Paez is going to present his work entitled Comparative Study of PID, DMC, and FASI PD plus I controls in a control laboratory kit. So, Diego, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Diego Paez. I'm a student from the Pontifical uh, Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, and I also work and collaborate with the University Santo Tomas of Bucaramanga, Colombia. Uh, so today I'm going to present this work that is a comparative study of a PID, DMC, and FUSIPD plus site controller in a control lab laboratory and in a control laboratory kit. And the outline of this uh, presentation begins with the introduction where I'm going to talk about G the motivation of, the, of this work. Then I'm going to present the main goal talk about the experiments that were run with uh, in this in this world the results and some conclusion so actually this was this work was developed when when I begin my PhD uh, in that in that moment I was living in Colombia because of the covid-19 mobility restriction and I worked there as a teacher at the University Santo Tomas, and there was a in in that time and well, uh, and before of that time, there was an increasing need to provide students with tool, uh, tools and equipment to run and develop uh, laboratory exercise or practice at home or remotely. But the problem here that was that the plans that we the process plans that we had in our la laboratory that we have in our laboratory what was this kind of process plan that as you can see is, is uh, these plans are the, with a big size uh, are difficult to move uh, we can provide uh, a plan of this type to every every student to take it at home and on the other hand we on the other hand we have some virtual laboratory uh, software, but the 
the experience of working with this this kind of simulation is not the same that work with these physical plants. So in in that order, we develop a, a low cost control laboratory kit that we call Control Lab, uh, that, uh, and this kit works as a temperature plant. Uh, we take inspiration on the already developed uh, Arduino basic temperature control plant, TC Lab, but there was a problem in that time because this TC Lab plant was, uh, you can buy it in United States, but for us it was easy in pandemia uh, buy this 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 kit. So we propose to develop this this new new board with some variations, uh, to trying to use uh, some components that were uh, were easy to found in our city, and and also adding a new and adding new functionalities to this to this board. So we develop an Arduino shield that has three transistors. These transistors work as a heaters because it's a temperature plant. So uh, each one of the transistor works as a heater, and each one of the transistor also has a, a temperature sensor. In this picture here, you can see the control lab board uh, assembled with the three transistors, and the shield work can work uh, with Every, uh, different types of uh, microchips or processing units like Arduino. So the operation of the plan well, for this for this work, uh, this, we only work with one of the heaters, and the operation is quite simple because uh, we were trying to control or we try to control here the the current that flows through the to the transistor, and in this way we can control the temperature of the transistor and close the control loop with the temperature sensor. So in that order, uh, we arrived to our main goal of, of this work that was perform a comparative student between a classic PID controller, a dynamic matrix, matrix controller, or a predictive, predictive controller, a Fuzzy PD plus I controller and the same Fuzzy PD plus I controller but optimized with a genetic algorithm. The design and tuning of this controller was made with uh, the mathematical model in a, in a first stage with the mathematical model of the plan and then the results of, of these designs and tuning were applied to the control lab plan. So the results that we were expecting was a uh, one one result it was to evaluate the behavior of of the of the control lab that we developed and thinking in that in that the students could, uh, could could use this plan at home without supervisors in the moment and also compare the performance of the control methods that I described before. So the experiments were uh, developed in three stages. In the first stage, uh, we focus on get the model of the plan. Uh, we use a MATLAB system identification toolbox to get our first uh, first models, and then we optimize the the model with a optimization algorithm. Then we did all the simulation and design of the controller with the model that we obtained in this uh, first stage. And after that, we performed the, the controller's co comparison using the metric integral of time weighted absolute error that uh, this me and this metrics, uh, this metrics let us to evaluate the uh, the change of so how the error evolved over the time and also how fast is the response of the system to achieve uh, the set the set point so that's why we use the this metrics to per, to perform the comparison between all the all the cons, all the controllers and also to optimize the fuzzy pd plus i controller and the last stage was simply to 
implement the results of the second stage, but on the physical plan. Okay, so the results, right now I'm going to show results from uh, all the controllers and three stages. The first stage was the get the, or was focused on getting the, the model of the plan, of one hitter of the plan. And we can see here that the initial guess that we get with my lab, this, I don't know, yeah, it's possible to see it. This initial get, uh, uh, guess, and in black, we have the actual proce process data of the board, and in red, we have the signal of the optimized model. So, in, in this, or with, with this model, then we uh, we did all the optimization and all the tuning of the all the of the controllers. The first controller wa that we tuned was the PID controller that, that you, we use as a reference because in here we was trying to uh, have a controller that achieve uh, the smallest rise time, serial time, and overshoot as possible. And in here we has we have the response the, of the model and of the plan, and it's easy to see in that picture that uh, the model have a really really good uh, performance when compared to the to the physical plan. Then the DMC controller that also is the the response of, of this controller that is more advanced in some ways of with the when compared with the PID controller is softer is softer uh, the serial time is is better than the PID controller but the rise time is a little bit uh, slower uh, when compared with the PID then the fuzzy PD plus side controller this con for this controller and thinking that we was using this this uh, board as a teaching tool we use a classical Fuzzy controller that has the as input the error and the derivation of the error with seven membership function and in there uh, for each input and for the output we also have seven seven membership function and the output was uh, set to variate between the uh, zero and one hundred percent of the PWN uh, PWN signal and this is the the di diagram that we use in Simulink, where in this first response with of the Fuzzy PD plus side controller, that we test with some different uh, constant here, the K KP, KD, KI, um, trying to get the best possible response. But, but as you can see there, it's the worst response until now. But then we use the, uh, the genetic algorithm to tune this, these constants and using the objective function that I, I described before, th that matrix, and we get the best result in compare, when compared with the other, with the other controllers. So in this final result, uh, we can see that the FUSI PD plus I optimized, uh, plus I optimized, uh, with genetic algorithms, uh, has the, the best performance when compared with the other, with the other controllers. Also, uh, the DMC controller that here is the tier controller, but this controller the, the problem here for this controller is, it, is simple. It was because wasn't optimized with some method or, or some methodology was only uh, testing trying to find the best configuration so I'm guessing that using here also the genetic algorithm I will have a better response here and um, for conclusions uh, we may use of this control lab laboratory kit to compare the performance of different controllers and the idea, the idea here that was to test this board or this kit with the students at home. Uh, we run practical experiments. Those, these are pictures of 
my students. Uh, it's in, was an interesting experience for me because uh, in our student is located in one city, uh, but the students at that time they live in different cities that are not close to to Bucaramanga, so we have to send the board to them and some uh, some of them uh, ensemble the board too. So it was very interesting for them the attention that that they present to or they show to work with this tool was was really really great. So that's all. So reference and thank you. Thank you very much, Diego, for your presentation. Do you have guys any question, Diego? Martin, how how much does it cost to make one of those uh, how much? Okay. kits? Uh, an idea, no? That doesn't mm -hmm. have. Uh, I want to show this this picture here. As you can see here, we only have three transistors that are very cheap. Tip tip tra uh, tier one transistor. Um, for example, we. The boards, the, these boards, we send it to China. That was for its, for 30 boards, we pay like, uh, $20 for the 30 boards. And, well, assemble this board is almost, well, right now, like $15. It's really cheap and can yeah. be and, using. And the most interesting is that the, the, the students can ensa ensemble the board by themselves. Yes, so, what's an interesting experience for, for that, for that. Thank you. And, the other, actually my, my question was in the same line. What about the price? And only com also compare with the results you showed in the last, uh, slide, right? Because, mm -hmm. You, you told us that you would love to try the genetic algorithms with the other controller. You mm -hmm. didn't do it. Are you planning to do it? And if you have to choose one of the controllers considering price, uh, how, how easy is to handle, um, considering the students to assemble, to assemble them, uh, which one would you choose? Well, the idea here is use this board to teach them the functionality of all the all controllers. Of them. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> the, the initial question was. No, um, actually it was related with the price, ah, the okay. results, the, and the other things. Which to, one is the best if you have to choose one? Uh, well, I, in that, in that order, like, as I said, the, the idea here was to teach the functionality of all the controllers and things that we can do uh, in this point, from this point, what is simple, for example, working with the tree of the transistor, increase the difficulty of the, of the system, and uh, we could use some of the, for example, yesterday, some, someone chose an experiment or, or a word of multi-objective optimization for a motor. We can use this, this kind of, of, uh, algorithms here to work with this, these three three transistors that will work as each each one of as a plan, but for instance, when, when this this transistor gets hot and uh, the temperature is uh, limited to one hundred uh, degrees, uh, the other transistor, the transistor that is close to him, also get hot too. So this uh, interaction between the three transistors uh, made the, uh, that uh, present a, dif a different challenge in in the moment to to design a, a different controller, for instance. I don't know. If I, uh, I got it. I got okay. it. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation and, and okay. the answers. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, the last presentation in this session is going to be done by 
Eduardo Aguiar, he's going to present uh, this work entitled A New Evolving Fuzzy System with Mechanism to Deal with Uncertainties in Time Series Forecasting. Thank you, Gaston, for introduction. Thank you, the audience also. Um, the paper is called Evolving Fuzzy Systems with Mechanisms to Deal with Uncertainties in, in Time Series Forecasting. Uh, it's authored by me, Eduardo Aguiar, uh, a professor from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, and uh, Kaique Alves, a PhD student uh, supervised by me uh, at the graduate program in computational modeling uh, at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, also. And two colleagues from UK, uh, Professor Christian Wagner and Durant Pescalan, uh, both from University of Nottingham. Uh, England. So, uh, our summary. Uh, here we have the introduction. Uh, in the past, in 2021, we discussed the new model uh, called uh, Evolving Participatory Learning uh, with Kernel Recursive Less Squares uh, and the DISCO. The DISCO was an improvement. Uh, in the classical, in the past models, uh, discussed by the colleagues from Federal University of Minas Gerais, from Campinas, uh, University, uh, Campinas University from Brazil, uh, and is a enhanced model, uh, that aims to, uh, improve some limitations in, in the concept of, of evolving fuzzy systems. And, in nowadays, uh, this is our first outcomes that I'm discussing here, uh, in name of the group. And we, we try to analyze the effects of noises, uh, when they are considered in the, as input of the model. So, this is the idea of the evolving fuzzy systems. It's the classical structure, by the way, uh, this structure was uh, very well explored by Professor Rosângela Barini during this week, during the conference, and during her speech uh, Wednesday. And here we have the, the input given by X. We have the, the first set of the, the first group covered by, by the letter A. And the, the main objective, the main goal here is to estimate the the output and the the proposed model uh is called uh EPL with the the acronym SD at the end of the name of the model and SD is related to the smoothing data and we have the, the, the we, we remain the, the antecedent, the antecedent part and the consequent part of the evolving fuzzy systems. And, uh, we establish the, 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 the clusters, the, the, how the clusters, uh, are based, are formed, and how we compute the rules, etc. Everything was the same, considering the, the past, the past works, the past authors. And, now we we are we still remain uh, the discussion of the participatory learning. Uh, the participatory learning uh, is is recommended to uh, problems uh, for uh, for online problems uh, uh, for the the stream data. For example, I have a, a, a real process and I have. And necessary to analyze the data that uh, appears during the process. So the participatory learning is a new concept, uh, strongly recommended for this kind of application. So uh, here you can see 
the compatibility measure, and the compatibility measure uh, defines the update, uh, the updating or creation uh, of the rules, uh, and the compatibility measure uh, is based on two uh, important uh, things called the arousal index and compatibility measure. Oh, uh, sorry, one important thing called arousal index. And the compatibility measure uh, has an important role during the process because uh, we can analyze if the, the rule will be created or updated. Okay, so it's a simple computation, it's a simple equation, as you can see in the projection, uh, given by the x, by the, the, the input data. Uh, v is the center of the cluster, and we have the, the, the standard deviation here given by sigma. And, um, and the, 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 the novelty here, the novelty here is, uh, is based on the estimation of the input vector. It's based on the estimation of the input vector. We apply a, a simple filtering approach uh, in order to estimate the correct value of the x, of the input vector. Uh, summarizing this discussion, we, we want to see the, the influence of the noise in the beginning of the process, in the input, in, in the input vector, and try to estimate and try to optimize the generation of centers of clusters of the rules, etc. So here you can see the standard deviation uh, is an important aspect to estimate the uncertainty in the data. Uh, this is a contribution from the colleagues of Nottingham, England. Uh, we have the, the running rate, the local scatter, and we want to see, we want to pay attention in the variation. Um, in the current cluster and the input vector. Here you can see the local scatter uh, interpreted by the possible way. Uh, and now, as I said before, uh, we, we try to apply this simple approach related to the filtering, to adaptive filtering and try to generate better results than uh, the past models discussed um, before by other colleagues. Uh, we <coughs> adopted the Gauss Gaussian shape function uh, instead of the Euclidean distance. The, the Euclidean distance is the main one uh, metric considering this kind of problem. And we try to to, to bring some new concept in, in this kind of discussion. Uh, here you can see the, the way that we calculate the arousal index. It's not new in this kind of discussion. The arousal index uh, is, a, is an important thing. It's an important thing here in this, in this model because uh, it indicates how similar an uh, observation is. Uh, to an existing cluster. So it's a simple decision. If the arousal index is, is greater than tau, then a threshold, uh, this information contributes, contributes to the learning process. Uh, otherwise, if, you lower, uh, if the arousal index is lower than tau, uh, the, this information, this sample, is not important, and we can go ahead in our process. Okay, the cluster center. How can I can we calculate the cluster center? Uh, have the running rate. Very important during this during the learning process. And now the results 
uh, we adopted two uh, two data sets, two uh, two benchmarks, uh, classical benchmarks in the literature, the MacGraphs, a lot of time series, and the nonlinear identification, uh, and we inject different levels of noise. Uh, in this, uh, in the, into the series, okay? And, uh, we analyze the performance in terms of, uh, the root mean square error, the RMSE, the non-dimensional index error, and the mean absolute error. This is the, the classical way to, to analyze, uh, this, this type of model. Uh, so, uh, Kaique always uh, used the MATLAB. Here you can see the hardware adopted to generate the results. Uh, prefer Python, but <laughs> uh, this was a choice made by Kaique, it's not by, by me. And here you can see our table summarizing our results. Uh, for Mac OS, uh, with uh, 20 Decibase of noise. Uh, DPR Carreras Disco is the number one. Uh, is, uh, is the paper uh, published in the Applied Soft Computing Journal last year. Uh, we have the EMG, the Evolving Multivariable Gaussian Model, discussed by the colleagues from Federal University of Minas Gerais and University of Campinas. The, the classical EPL, and we compared our, our, our results with other classical models, uh, such as the Amphis, the, the multi-layer perceptron, artificial neural network, and the support vector machine, also. So, for MacGraphs, is a kind of time series, uh, our model, our model performed well, uh, with interesting results, uh, is a, is an interpretable model, and with 10 dB, then the CBAs, uh, our model still performed very well. And the absence of noise, the, 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 the original time series, uh, the, the, the smoothing data, the model based on smoothing data, uh, won again. Okay? Uh, now you can see the time series for 20 decibels for 10 decibels, and uh, the, the classical one, okay? Uh, the evolution of the rules created during the learning process, uh, during the beginning of the, the learning process, have improvement in the number of, the, of generated rules. This is natural, this is expected behavior, by the way, because uh, the model are learning. Uh, in terms of the data, input data. Uh, for 10 dB, similar behavior. We finished the process with 27 rules. It's, it's, it's the cost paid by the better results. And for the classical one, it's similar. Now, the, the no linear equation, the no linear identification system is a classical benchmark. For this kind of process, the, the groups, the, the authors that work that work with time series know this kind of benchmark. Have some assumptions here. Uh, for no the, for no linear, our proposal performs very well compared with the, the other ones. Uh, for 10 dB, the, 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 uh, before uh, and now for zero dB. Uh, the Amphis performed a little bit better than our discussion, and uh, this can can occur. Uh, so uh, the model won for six for six six cases. The model won five times. It's promising. So. Uh, now you can see the, the time series for 20 decibels, 10 decibels, 
and the original one. The evolution of the rules for the three, qua three cases or all situations related to this uh, benchmark. 10 decibels and the classic command. So, the conclusions, this is, is important to, to discuss some points. This is uh, our first outcomes related to this issue. So, we need, we need a lot to do uh, in the next months. In the next, uh, so, uh, is, a, is, a, is promising, we generated better results. Uh, the recursive filtering uh, was uh, contributed to generate better results. Uh, so it's a, it's a new mechanism to deal with uncertainties in the, in the data, considering this forecast problem. So we are uh, so confident with next steps. Okay. As I said before, we won in five of six data sets, and for future works, we try. We're gonna try to apply in real world problem in an online application, and this is all for our side. I want to thank you, the audience. Thank you, the organizers. And if you have questions, please let me know. Thank you, Eduardo, for your presentation. Anyone in the audience wants to make any question? Okay, Eduardo, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, you mentioned that you were using estimated data, not the real one, right? And do you know how far is that estimation data from the real one? Um, they are corrupted by noise. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 there are some important questions uh, that the authors need to pay attention for when we are discussing forecasting problems. Uh, outliers, noisy data. Uh, so we try to investigate this to, to, to make a first discussion towards this issue. So 20, we consider 20 dB, 10 dB of noisy. But uh, our idea in the future is to consider new kinds of noises. We, we can consider new kinds of noises related to uh, additive white Gaussian noise, uh, Poisson noise, uh, in order to challenge the model. We, we believe that this level of noise is enough to, to do the first analysis, analysis and go ahead, or no. And our idea is go ahead, of course. Uh, okay, and, and, and actually the second question was related to the previous one. Uh -huh. uh, regarding the, you mentioned that you were using Gaussian instead of the Euclidean distance yes. because of the noise, right? But what level of noise? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. yes. Between 20 and 20, 10 and 20 maybe? That's the, the parameter? Yes, it's enough. It's enough. Okay. And there is a trick here because uh, we are using Gaussian membership functions and uh, our, our noise is, is normally distributed. So uh, it's a tricky. It's a tricky. This is our idea in the future. But new kinds of noise and challenging the model to see how Hubbins, Hubbins, Hubbins test the model is. This is, uh, this is our idea. Okay, Eduardo, thank you very much again. Thank and you thank you all for being here. Okay, with, uh, this is the end of the session number six. So right now we have time for, no, actually this is the end, right? We are going to, Come later for session number four at 1.30 p.m.